Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast, brought to you by Canon Press. I wanted to make sure you were aware that next week is Canon's annual fall sale. October 7th through the 11th, almost everything in the store is 30% off. Don't miss out. Welcome to Plodcast, episode 112. The Plodcast, episode 112. As we're going, um, what are we going to? We're, as we're, we're not going to print. As we're, as we're recording this, that's the way I want to put it. As we're recording this, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the Bolsheviks running for the Democratic nomination, in this case it's Beto O'Rourke, uh, promised that if elected, all semi-automatic weapons would be confiscated. He, there was a shooting uh, in the aftermath of a traffic stop. Uh, there was a shooting in Texas uh, a few days ago. And uh, a reporter asked O'Rourke, how would you reassure gun, odor, gun owners who are afraid that the government's going to come for their semi-automatic weapons? If you keep, if you keep talking about gun control like this, what are you going to say to the people to reassure them that you're not coming for their semi-automatic weapons. And uh, O'Rourke replied, well, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, you keep in mind that, um, that O'Rourke is bumping along in the polls down at the 1% level. That, you know, he's, he's not getting any traction. So some of this might be uh, regarded as wild flailing in order to get some attention from uh, some of the voters in the Democratic primary, and, and it's a situation where he's willing to say or do anything to get, uh, to get that attention. Um, at the same time, there's no reason not to take it seriously. It's, it, it's certainly something that people on the left believe. So they, they'd say, I don't, I don't see any reason why uh, you rank and file people need guns. I don't see any reason why you need, would need a gun. Now, th- there is, um, let me ask you, um, we oftentimes find ourselves talking at cross purposes, as though the gun control advocates say, on the one hand, you've got the kind of weapons that are used in school shootings, and then all of you squirrel hunters out there with your muzzle loaders uh, are fighting tenaciously because you love your squirrel hunting so much, and you, and you love your outdoorsy stuff so much that you're willing to fight for the uh, semi-automatic and automatic weapons that have no, no possible use except for shooting up a school. Um, and that's how the debate is represented in many people's minds. But, it's, but the Second Amendment is not about hunting. The Second Amendment certainly allows for hunting. The Second Amendment certainly allows for sportsmanship. Um, but that's not what it's about. The reason for the Second Amendment has to do with uh, the need for a well-regulated uh, militia. Uh, my wife and I just came back from vacationing in uh, France, and we spent a couple of nights in Switzerland. And Switzerland is a p- place where, where gun ownership is mandatory. So, um, and it's military-level gun ownership is mandatory. Every, every man in that country needs to own a gun, and every man needs to be trained in how to use it, and every home has to, has to have that gun. The reason for that is not because Switzerland is overrun with squirrels. The reason for that is they are interested in tenaciously defending their independence. If in the Second World War, if the Germans had invaded or if some uh, hostile power where Switzerland was staying neutral and staying out of it, if some hostile power invaded, they would find that they had their hands full because there were weapons everywhere. Put another way, do you think the residents of Hong Kong wish that they were more like Switzerland right now? I'll put another way, that if the, if Hong Kong, if there were a weapon like, if the, if the residents of Hong Kong 
had a weapon in their home the same way the Swiss had a weapon in their home, we wouldn't be having these showdowns. The, the showdowns are having to happen with, in, by means of massive protests precisely because uh, it, that's the very arduous and difficult way of getting your government to pay attention when you, when you have no weaponry. So what it boils down to is uh, the Second Amendment was established so that there would be a bulwark against government tyranny. There would be a bulwark against governmental tyranny. And when people say, uh, you, when, when people say, what do you mean government tyr tyranny? You're out of your mind. What government tyranny? Are you crazy? There's no government tyranny. Anybody who says, we're going to come and take your guns, that's exhibit A on why you need your guns. Once they take your guns, what else are they going to take? Once they take your guns, what else are they going to take? You've, you've already admitted that they have the authority to walk waltz in and do whatever. You know, do whatever. What's next? Okay. So um, this is, uh, I think it was George Washington who said that uh, guns are liberty's teeth. I think that's a good way of thinking about it. So, podcast episode one twelve. We're carrying on, and we come to the uh, our hamartiology section. Uh, uh, the word here is this is a jawbreaker, apostamatizo, apostamatizo, uh, and this is here's another jawbreaker. This one is a hapax legomenon. Now, a hapax legomenon means that this is a word that's used in the New Testament exactly once. And this is the instance that we're going to be talking about, the one instance where uh, it is used. The word means to provoke. Right? The word means to provoke. It, re it refers to a zealous desire to get at somebody. And so you're trying to treat them in such a way as to get the reaction you need in order to be able to get, uh, in order to be able to get back at them. This is how the scribes and Pharisees responded to the Lord's teaching. Luke eleven fifty three says this, And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him, that's our word, and to provoke him to speak of many things. They were jabbing at him, coming after him, snarling at him, pestering him. They were trying to provoke him into a, into a reaction. Now, this is a, this is a, a genuinely odd sin. It... Um, represents, not necessarily all the time, but it represents many, in many instances, a weird sort of retroactive justification. A weird sort of retroactive justification. You mistreat someone in order to get them to do something that would justify the initial mistreatment, right? And so you, you pester someone, pester someone, pester someone, pester someone, and finally they lose their temper at you because you're, you're pestering them this way. And when they lose their temper, you say, ah, oh, see, they're not so godly. They're not so hot. They're the kind of person that this kind of pestering was appropriate for. So, uh, but that explosion of temper wasn't, um, wasn't in the picture before you, before you started the, the pestering. So, um, uh, however unfair this w method of proceeding manifestly is, we all know what that sentiment feels like. And when, when you get into a quarrel, uh, and, and to be blunt and honest, I think a lot of married couples have to learn how to recognize this particular temptation where you're provoking the other person, and the first person that sins big is the loser. <laughs> right? So you, um, you walk up to one, one another's, each of you has a pot on the stove, and you walk up to the other person's pot and you surreptitiously turn up the burner and just by little teeny increments. And finally, the first person to boil over loses. Um, but the boiling over was caused by the other person. So um, when, you prov when you're provoking someone, you're trying to get them to do something that would justify your mistreatment of them, that would justify your assessment of them, that would justify uh, why you are approaching it this way. So, um, for our book review uh, this time, 
I'm um, reviewing a book called Copy Fights. Copy Fights. Um, now, I, a few episodes ago, I reviewed a book uh, called Against Intellectual Monopoly, and that was on um, copyright law, patent law, and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm sort of on this, uh, uh, I'm on a jag uh, uh, pursuing this particular uh, topic because I'd I'd like to work through it and think about it and and maybe write something uh, on it myself and then depending on what conclusions I come to when I write a book on this you can check the front to see if it's copyrighted or not now um, this book uh, so the previous book I I um, uh, reviewed against intellectual monopoly was by a couple of authors and I talked about it then this book copy fights is uh, put out by the Cato Institute. A libertarian think tank, and it's a collection of essays from uh, people who are generally in the libertarian camp, but they they are representing different uh, positions on the issue of copyrights and patents. So, uh, and I'm learning an awful lot about uh, about all the um, all the things that are going on. Um, so, there are four basic types of intellectual property. Four basic types of intellectual property at least in, uh, in our laws. Uh, they are copyrights, there's the copyright, there's the patent, there's the trade secret, and there's the trademark, okay? You can't, you, you can't start a business with your logo being the Nike swoosh. That's, tra- that's a trademark, that's a registered trademark. Uh, if you, um, let's say someone broke into uh, Coca-Cola headquarters and found the recipe for making Coke and posted it on a website, uh, an, an anonymous website, and they, that person was arrested three weeks later. But by the time that person was arrested and the website shut down, about 10 million people had downloaded the recipe for Coca-Cola. Um, that's a trade secret. Person who stole the recipe could be prosecuted for that, but all the people who downloaded it and who now know how to make something taste like Coca-Cola, they're fine. They're they're in possession of the the information, um, and th- they didn't steal or anything or violate any uh, contracts or agreements or non-disclosure agreements in order to get that information. They just found it on the internet. Right, so that's a trade secret. Patent would have to do with an inv- invention, a gizmo, a uh, gadget. And copyright would have to do with uh, poems, essays, short stories, books, uh, you know, novels, uh, uh, movies, uh, uh, and so on. Now, when, um, when dealing with it, there's, there's two things about this. It really is a fascinating, it really is a fascinating subject because Let's say you're you're talking about something a material you know material property something that has defined edges like a widget this widget is mine or this car is mine or this house is mine so uh, when I say this house and this piece of property are mine that means I live here other people don't live here and I can define the precise boundaries and edges of that property. And it's pretty easy. It's it's pretty, it's defined. Okay. Uh, And, um, and the sale of my property, whether, whether it's um, a commodity, I'm selling, selling shoes or guitars or pianos or wheat. um, The commodity that I sell to someone, he goes and uses it. If he grinds the wheat up and makes a loaf of bread and he eats it, that means that somebody else can't grind it up and make a loaf of bread and eat it, which means that the price is set because of built-in scarcity. The, the object or the property or the thing in question can only have one use. But the um, ideas are not like that. So, so um, uh, if I have a bright idea, let's, let's say I... Um, I'm carrying bricks all day long, and one day I invent the wheelbarrow. I say, hey, you know, this would be a lot easier if I did this. Um, that idea is transferable, 
And the only way, what's happening with monopolies, what, what's happening with monopolies and copyrights and, and patents is that you're trying to introduce an artificial scarcity because there's no reason why people up and down the, the road can't look at my wheelbarrow and say, hey, good idea. And they start, they make their own, and, but I still have mine. So if, um, basically ideas multiply. There's, there's no natural creational scarcity to an idea. Okay, now there's another aspect to this, and I just want to touch on it. I, 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 like I said, this is, the whole thing is fascinating. I just think it's fun. Um, it's interesting to me that when people talk about intellectual property, I want to ask many of them, they're not writing from a believing standpoint at all, I want to say, well, what is the intellect? I would prefer perhaps to, to call this not a matter of intellectual property, but of spiritual property. Not intellectual property, but spiritual property. If, um, if, if, if you have an evolutionary world, uh, two dogs can fight over a piece of meat because both dogs can define the meat. Both, uh, um, both dogs know where it is. They know what it is. They know that they would rather have it rather than the other dog having it. There is no problem. The, do the dogs are not having any problem with definitions. But how can you have intellectual property? How, how, do you, how can you have uh, ownership of an idea? Okay. Um, and you might say, well, uh, we're created in the image of God. What about that? Well, do animals have ideas? Well, yeah, they do. Um, I read a book on uh, uh, some time ago, maybe last year, a uh, great book called The Genius of Birds. And a particular kind of bird, I forgot the species, but a particular kind of bird in England figured out um, figured out how to, um, um, this, I, I ran across this in two books, actually, but um, here's the point. Uh, a bird figured out how to uh, perforate the, the top of milk bottles that were delivered to houses and get the cream off the top of the milk. So, um, so, so this bird figured out how to take the, tin, the, the, the foil uh, lid off and get at the cream. And that idea spread across a certain section of England from bird to bird, um, which is, well, what is that? That's intellectual property. Does that mean copyright needs to extend to the animal kingdom? I don't know. Yeah, it's a complicated subject. So copyrights, copy fights, excuse me, copy fights is a, um, uh, is a good book if you want to read various pros and cons, all of them generally coming from a libertarian perspective. Some of them are friendly to um, intellectual property rights. Some of them, all of them grant a certain measure of, we have to have a certain amount of it, but um, just, I just get the book, check it out. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.